I'm Anna Petz, Program Coordinator for Characterising South Australia's Cover at the Geological Survey of South Australia within the Department of Energy and Mining. The department aims to provide our stakeholders with exciting data products that provide new research and ideas. The Geological Survey of South Australia is working with CSIRO on a new regolith exploration technique called Ultrafine Plus. I'm here today to talk with Dr Ryan Noble. Ryan is a Principal Research Scientist at CSIRO and also the Group Leader for Predictive Mineral Systems Science. Thanks for being here with us today, Ryan. Can you describe the project and the innovations used? Yeah, thanks, and it's really nice to be here. I guess the project is really about characterising a large area as efficiently and as effectively as possible. It's really to get an essential understanding of the geochemical background of an area, um, mainly for, I guess, mineral exploration, but also in environmental assessments for the future. And I, this project looked at 150 soil samples in a, a quite a large area, but the two real innovations that we use, both of which I'm, I'm pretty passionate about, passionate about, are um, dynamic or what we call active sampling, and that's kind of getting away from grid, traditional grid-based sampling techniques. And the other one is the ultrafine soil geochemistry, and and that uses a lot of other associated data, which is quite um, different from typical geochemical analysis. Uh, both of these are innovative to an extent in that they use um, machine learning and data integration. And I think that's where a lot of science, not just mineral exploration, is going with the, the current sort of wave of knowledge and, and pushing these sorts of new data and analytics into uh, a more applied space. How would these project results be used for exploration and mining? I mean, mainly for, in terms of exploration, it's around understanding when you're sampling and you have some unusual result, perhaps you're looking for gold or nickel and you get a number, it's, you, you've got to be able to put that number into context. So it's about understanding what is an anomaly. And for, I think, a lot of the work for the surveys and, and other organisations to do is provide that background knowledge. So in this case, it's, it's what is that, the region of Takula, uh, what is their background soil geochemistry? So we're trying to, to understand characterize that area and say, well, you know, if you have nickel values at maybe 100 parts per million, that's a background. And if you get something that's maybe 500 or 1,000, that's something really of real interest for mineral exploration. And that's possibly where you should go and look further. Um, these, these applications can also be used in environmental management and ecological type studies. It's all about understanding your baseline uh, environment. That's great. Ryan, what are the benefits of these techniques? There's two, I guess, two techniques that I would talk about today. One is the active sampling and, I'll, I'll, and the other one is the ultrafines. I'll start with the active sampling first. And it's really about maximising the information that we gather while sort of minimising the environmental impact and also minimising the effort almost to required to collect that information. So for this project, we designed the sampling to be within proximity of roads uh, to again, get into an area but not uh, have to you know cross sensitive country or you know damage the ecosystems any more than we had to so the idea was that we would use the spatial data uh, to inform where we would sample across that region and then make sure the, the technique we used picked representative samples over that area, but within 50 or 100 metres of all the accessible roads. For the ultrafines geochemistry, that's really about, again, maximising information, but it comes, uh, but it's around the information you can gather out of the geochemistry itself and the, the samples that are collected. So a lot of traditional soil geochemistry would just collect a suite of elements, and that might be 30 to 50 elements. And what the ultrafine technique does, one, it separates out finer particles, and I'll come back to why that's uh, a benefit. But the, the other thing it does is it not only provides those 30 to 60 elements, it also provides a whole lot of other information that we, we know we can collect but we routinely don't. So in the mineral exploration space, that's things like soil pH, uh, indicators of mineralogy. So in, this, in the ultrafine technique, we use spectral sensors to give a proxy for major mineral phases so we understand you know, what what types of clays are in those materials what types of iron oxides and all these and how does that influence our understanding of the chemistry so we're gathering that information as well and that's kind of a 
quite a change in the way we've traditionally done that. And all these things, and the reason we look at the small stuff is because it's the materials that actually bind um, rogue elements moving through that transport environment. So the big challenge for mineral explorers in much of Australia and, and certainly a large expanse of South Australia is that the deposits that they're looking for are often covered up under a transported cover. And this might be sand dunes is a really good example, uh, but it could be other types of sediments as well. And when we've done experimental work, and this is both in the lab and some small field experiments, we buried ore deposits or weathered them and we looked at how they moved up through a soil profile. And what we found was that quite rapidly, some of these materials, these were gold particles, um, zinc particles, were moving up through the profile, but they were actually really kind of very small and they were transient. So they could be washed out or they could be shifted quite rapidly. But those materials were all very small and they were binding onto these things like clays and iron oxide. So we designed the technique to really harness the collection of those materials and hopefully give us a better signature for mineral explorers. That's great, Ryan. I've got a question I didn't include on the sheet, but um, we get often get asked. We often get asked at the geological survey, like how deep uh, does ultrafine plus work? What's the sort of limits of the technique? Yeah, I think the limits. Uh, are probably in the order of five to 30 metres is where it's designed to work in terms of transport and cover. We've seen some good evidence in that you know, five to 15 metres is, is very um, likely to move signatures up through the cover. Uh, I think it could go deeper than that. And what I, I sort of talk to industry about is if you're looking at this as a technique, what you need to understand is if you've got thicker cover, you need to understand what might be a viable mechanism for those materials to move up through that profile. So whether you've had multiple small layering of those where, you know, the signature could get trapped and move up a little bit, maybe it only moves five or ten metres, but then there's another five or ten metres that comes in on top of that. And it gets diluted as it goes up through the profile. Things like vegetation can, can cycle metals up through the profile. So if you've got large eucalypt forest, for example, that can you know, maybe have roots down to 20 or 30 metres, that's another mechanism that might get through that cover. And then there's, you know, perched water tables and groundwater and fluxes and those things that tend to, tend to uh, accelerate weathering, but they also tend to trap some of those geochemical anomalies. So that's that's one of the ways that these, these signatures get up through the profile. But I think in the past, in terms of uh, surface geochemistry or near-surface geochemistry, we've been a little bit unrealistic and probably over sold uh, some of the newer techniques and so I'm hesitant to say it will go much deeper than you know 30 meters but uh, there's potential where it could go a little bit deeper but I think you know in places where you've got a you know, 50 to like 250 or 300 meters of cover I think it's unrealistic to think that you're going to collect a soil sample that has a clear signature of something that's you know hundreds of meters below. Yeah that's a great answer thanks Ryan. We all know 2020 has been a challenging year and due to lockdown, you've not been able to come over to South Australia to do the survey, but you helped us remotely from Western Australia. Can you tell me about or tell us about the project highlights? Yeah, I think it's it's been a real a different year for, for everyone. Um, one of the things that I found about the project that I've really enjoyed is, is we had to sort of switch uh, the way we, I guess, engage with the survey and also the way we transferred the technology. So a lot of this, there was uh, a lot of knowledge being transferred both directions. So from the survey's point of view, we were you know, feeding us information about the area we were going to work, walk into and also the spatial data sets that were available to guide the sampling. And then likewise, what we, what I didn't touch on with the, in the early questions was around some of the the tech that we've used to enhance the sampling. So we use you know, tablets that are set up with rapid drop downs for data collection and information gathering. This is a, it's called the FAMES app, which is a field information management system, but it, it just enables rapid data collection. We had to really rapidly change the way we planned our sampling. So this, the project went through about three iterations of, of best sampling locations. And I think one of the highlights for us was that we were able to do this really quite rapidly uh, and faster than we expected, which for me gave us, uh, I guess, a new uh, way to work through this in the future and, and made the, the viability of, of 
um, sampling plans that you change on the fly almost much more feasible. And I think the real highlights were around that close communication between the, the two groups. But also I think a lot of the highlights we won't see initially. I think what we'll, we'll see in the future is changes of practice for explorers, but we'll also see explorers and, and other people using this data going into these areas armed with a much better understanding of the surface geochemistry, armed with a better understanding of the landscape. And I think that's not just this project, but it's a number of sort of successful collaborative projects we've had between GSSA and CSIRO. Thank you so much, Ryan. It was a great summary of, of what happened out in the field and the project itself. I'm really looking forward to seeing the report later this year and um, working with you on those final interpretations. I definitely know it was a great project to be involved in and the fieldwork was challenging. We had a, we had a sort of uh, midwinter rain that made us have to go back out a second time round and uh, definitely, you know, finding tracks that weren't there anymore or obviously it's a dynamic landscape, everything's changing all the time. It was really great to have your support when we were able to redo the sampling and um, find out different points that would make it a bit easier for us to finish the project in the time that we had allowed. So uh, looking back, you know, taking this uh, ultra fine technique was very easy to do. Um, really appreciated just having that guidance on initially, you know, even by emails about how to do the sampling. And it was great having some people on board that had done the sampling before at Campana. So following on that project that we'd done earlier and that collaboration with CSIRO made it a lot easier to get out in the field and, and test this in a new area. So thank you so much for all that help. Yeah, you're most welcome and really looking forward to seeing what comes out uh, in Discovery Days, both coming up this in, in November and possibly future years as well. That's, that's right. Let's uh, look forward to future collaborations. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks.